Unraveling the Mysteries of Hydrogenic Atoms from Bohr Energies to Lineman Series. Perhaps you've encountered this image previously, or even this one, but what links them together? Greetings, fellow science enthusiasts. Strap in for an electrifying journey through the quantum cosmos. Join us as we venture into the atomic abyss to decode the secrets of hydrogenic atoms. From calculating Bohr energies to Bohr radii and a Rydberg constant, we'll traverse the intricacies of atomic physics. But that's not all. Stay glued as we illuminate the path of the Lineman series through the electromagnetic spectrum for ionized helium and doubly ionized lithium, unlocking the hidden wonders of the subatomic world. By the end of this video, you'll be able to understand the, hydronic, the hydrogen atoms, or hydrogen-like atoms, uh, and how easy they are to work with, find spectral wavelengths for a couple of these atoms, and understand the spectral graphs. So let's see what we're tasked with doing. As defined, a hydrogenic atom consists of a single electron orbiting a nucleus with Z protons. And we want to determine the Bohr energy, the binding energy, the Bohr radius, and the Rydberg constant for a hydronic atom, hydrogenic atom. Where in the electromagnetic spectrum would the Lyman series fall for Z equals two and Z equals three? Now take for a second, what do you think Z equal two and Z equal three represent based on this definition? Before we start, I'd like to mention that there is a free companion PDF available for you to follow along. You can access it using the link below. Alrighty, so let's get started. What is the easiest approach, which is highlighted in the um, question by the author as well, is that we are trying to modify the hydrogen potential energy. That is, from the Coulombic potential of a single proton and a single electron, not the electric potential. This theory is dealt dealing with the Hamiltonian and thus we need the potential energy. Um, so although they're closely related, not quite the same thing. So just be aware, that's what we need. What we want to do is modify the potential, which is what we see here, potential energy, and where we just have E squared, since we know that E, the electron is negative E, the proton is positive E, so we get the E squared there. But now that we have more protons, we have Z to add to that. So that is what we're trying to do. And in the case of Z equals one, we just get the hydrogen atom itself. So that's a good check. But with this modification, we know that the Bohr energy, which is stated as En equals negative, and then all of these constants to the one over N squared, where N ranges from one to positive infinity, this can be modified since we have an E squared in this uh, parentheses as such, where we put the Z on the E squared as well. But in order to simplify this in terms of the original energies, we have to factor this out, and that's what we do in our next step where we have a z uh, squared. Noticing here that we can't just pull out a z, we have to apply the square on it too. That's why it's color coded as such so we can quickly see. Now with that in the bank, we can see that this bracket here is just the original Bohr energy. So we put that back in, and now we can see how the Bohr energy is modified. That being said, we can move on to the binding energy, which was just the case of how much energy is it going to take to move us from the ground state to an excited state. Um, again, units here for the negative sign are just a reference to the system being used. And in this book, this negative sign comes from Griffith's orientation. Uh, but with that being said, we were at negative one uh, or negative 13.6 electron volts. Let's see how this modifies to hydrogenic atoms. Well, as you might have sneaked out or witnessed, just be plugging into the Bohr energy formula for n equals one, gives us a z squared e1. So plug that through, you get negative uh, 13.6 eV times however many protons. Not too bad. The Bohr radius follows similar suit, so that this is what is described in the book. Uh, this is different from the fine structure constant, which is alpha, which is that one over 37 or one over 137 although they are closely related, which we'll find out in due time. That being said though, we see that we have an E squared here, so we need to modify that with the Z E squared. And when we do so, we see that by again, factoring out the Z, 
we get a one over Z and we know that that a the bore radius comes from whatever is introduced or rather is the same bore radius that we had here just with the factored out Z easy enough similarly Rogberg Rogberg's constant is defined as such but you see we have an E squared term here so let's apply the modification when we do so we see that we get a Z E squared now in the modified um, for hydrogenic atoms and so we just plug it out or factor it out like we did with the energy and now you see that Rydberg constant times Z squared is the new Rydberg constant for the hydrogenic atoms all of this is on par finally then the Rydberg formula which we'll need for the next part is given as such and then if we apply the modification we just have to put a Z squared out there easy enough we can deal with that not bad at all now the modification was quick and easy but now we have to dive into a little more intricacy of what is the lineman series and we know that we have several energy levels in all of these quantum systems so what is being uh, what is being uh, communicated with the series is well in the case of lineman series i have excited states that are above my ground state so what happens when i interact with other medium specifically light well, I could uh, transition to the ground state based on whatever other interactions I have in the quantum system. So the summary of this is that Lyman series tell us what happens to the atom as the electron goes from some higher initial state to the ground state. And that's what we have summarized here. So the Lyman series, again, is represented by transitions to the ground state from whatever other higher energy level. There are, there are other series like this, uh, mainly the Balmer and Paxson series, which you can study in depth later, but nonetheless, be aware that they are out there. Let's dive into how this series can be calculated with the given uh, parameters. All right, so first and foremost, we saw how the Rydberg constant and the Rydberg formula led us to a wavelength with the respective uh, energy levels namely the n values so here though we have a hydrogenic atom so we have a z squared term out front that's fine what else we what we need to realize as well is that we had f uh, n f equal one so this leading term goes to one and again i have a little more work about this in the pdf just this is the quick summary of it so we can get the concepts down um, but i have a green form here because we know that one over one squared gives us one not bad we can see that in a green form but i also have the purple form here which is find a common denominator and simplify it down the reason will become apparent in just a second but we're interested in the wavelengths of the uh spectrum right so we need to invert both of these and when we do so we get the constants out front on both of them easy enough we have one over this green form and then we just take the reciprocal of the purple form the reason for this is because we know that since the closest energy level to the ground state is ni equals 2, this is a much simpler form in the purple to be able to simplify it down. And the green form for n equals infinity is a much simpler form to handle as we see here. Lambda close or lambda c just equals lambda close. This is telling us or what I'm trying to communicate is that this is the closest energy level to the ground state not necessarily the wavelength is closest similarly for lambda f this is the furthest uh, energy level away from the ground state so what we're analyzing are the two boundary conditions of the energy state so that we can find a notable range for the particular values of z that we might encounter and we need these ranges so that we can understand where in the electromagnetic in the electromagnetic spectrum we have um, our absorption and emission spectra coming out of. Ugh, a lot of words, but let's dive into the particular cases that we're given. So for the hydrogenic atoms, we had in particular the case of Z equals two and Z equals three. In the case of Z equals two, this was just the ionized helium. We got rid of one electron. The doubly ionized lithium, we got rid of two electrons. So we know that for lithium, we had three protons, helium, we had two, and we're good. Plug them into the forms that we had there, and we see that when we plug in two, we get a four, four cancel, not bad. This leads us to one of the boundary terms for 
the uh, states closest to the ground state, and then the other wavelength for the uh, cases of something being further away, the ground state energy and the highest energy level. So we know that if we have the two boundary cases on it, we can determine what range of wavelengths these two fall into. And normally for hydrogen, this falls into the ultraviolet. So that is what we are going to compare against. Similarly, for the doubly ionized lithium, we have here that, oh, that should just be three. I don't know why that's 33. That's a three squared, oops. Um, but as you see here, we have three squared times three that's three times three times three, that gives us 27. That's a typo again. And then for the furthest, we just have the same thing, one over nine, easy enough, you can see the calculations, but the goal here is that we get another set of ranges that we need to compare to. And what exactly are we comparing to? Well, this is what I've been rambling about. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. And here, it being a spectrum, we need particular ranges so that we can understand where these wavelengths are falling into. So out of the entire electromagnetic spectrum that we have right now, going from tiny wavelengths for gamma radiation all the way up to somewhat big wavelengths with uh, 10 meters for radio waves and then their frequencies down here, we see that between ultraviolet and infrared, infrared, we have the visible spectrum, which as you see is a very, very, very narrow sliver of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So there's plenty of other resource for this that's a little easier to comprehend and I'll link them below. But for us, all I'm trying to highlight is that we have violet through red and we need to classify where the wavelengths for these two hydrogenic atoms fall in given that we want the lime in series. So we're transitioning from uh, infinity to two, and two and infinity at the boundaries to the ground state. And so what we're trying to compare to is if this is the lowest, if, if this is the lowest wavelength and this is the highest wavelength, then we know that that series as a whole falls in the ultraviolet. So let's go ahead and check that out. Okay, so with all the rambling I've done, let's tidy it all together with the graph. Graphs are essential for understanding and we can just get a lot from them. The goal of the previous calculations was to show what happens over the entirety of the range of possible wavelengths given the Z equals two and Z equals three, the ionized helium and the doubly ionized lithium respectively. In the case of Lyman series, we know that we are transitioning to the ground state. That means that our minimum here is the first excited state that we can be away. And that's what's graphed here with the red vertical line. Now, what we're trying to do is classify these uh, wavelength spectrums, because we have a whole host of different wavelengths that could be the case from two to infinity, as we see plotted on the x-axis. Um, so we have to realize that we know that the Lyman series typically fall within the ultraviolet region for hydrogen, and that's what's graphed here. That horizontal line that's dotted in purple is the UV minimum on the edge case of the uh, possible wavelengths. So you see for the doubly ionized lithium, we asymptote pretty close to that as we get to our edge case. And as you see, it does not take that many cases for us to get to almost a flat line. So really by eight or nine, you can start to see the end behavior be pretty similar. That's why you never see graphs of these going to like a hundred, just doesn't make sense. And there's other energy structures available. But nonetheless, theoretics allows us to do that. As we see for the uh, the ionized helium though, the blue line, we see that we are well above the minimum and well below the maximum. So we're good there. But these graphs are just telling us the possible ranges that could potentially exist. What, what are these the ranges of though? Well, let's go back to the picture we first saw. These two things. Now, at first glance, they look kind of weird, but they're very important to us. They're pretty in colors and all that other fun stuff, but what we can note here is that their application is crucial both in chemistry and astrophysics and several other realms of science when we need to know or find out an unknown compound, atom, or composition of molecules. The reason why is because every atomic element has a unique absorption and emission spectrum. And the emission spectrum are dark with lit bands and the absorption spectra are lit with dark bands. 
basically they're conjugates of each other in a, in a way they're opposites whatever words you want to use they're telling us the same thing just in a different perspective what am i giving out what am i taking in that's what we're doing um uh, there's a great link for this that where i took these pictures from that has a whole lesson about this so i'm definitely going to link that below if in case you're interested in more it's a wonderful website uh, but what we can take away from this is that we can match these uh, emission spectra, which we know that each one of these lines may correspond to like n equal two, n equal three, four, five, things like that. That's what we're looking for. And when we match those up, we can be able to determine what is the composition of a gas giant so many light years away in astrophysics or the new chemical composition of an unknown substance for forensics. Applications are several and diverse. But the whole goal here and what the Rogberg formula was made off of was the fact that the wavelength of the photon for a band on the spectrum depends on the energy difference between the electron energy levels. So it's the change in energy, the delta of the energy that matters. And that's why we have to transition from a higher to a lower. And that's what we're measuring here. But we'll talk about this more in depth in a few chapters when we get to the fine structure constant and the Zeeman effect. So just be aware, this is the ground, the ground state of spectrum analysis for what we will encounter. In summary, you now know how to modify the hydrogen model for hydrogenic like atoms. Although if you would like to solve the Schrodinger equation for each case, you know, it'd be a good exercise. I don't think it'd be very time efficient though. You also know how to find the spectral ranges for a particular series and atom, in this case, the Lyman series, where Ni equals two, and can go up to infinity, and the particular atoms for Z equals two and Z equals three, and then put this all together, you now know how to uh, interpret these graphs, at least a little more, I didn't do too much of a deep dive on it, um, and understand some of their applications, although I don't think I did it justice in just how powerful they are and how many times we use them. So, but at least you're exposed to it and can we can go deeper in it if you'd like if you enjoyed this please consider supporting this channel by subscribing and sharing this curiosity books notes and other reference materials are found below and if you have any questions please feel free to reach out this stuff is fun and it's a great conversation to have if you're interested in understanding atomic and molecular physics because guess what we talk in wavelengths and spectra as always thank you for watching until next time, stay curious.